Uh, so the next speaker is Mike Lefby. Mike is currently the executive director of the Niagara Resource Service for Youth, the RAFT, a not-for-profit agency in the Niagara region working with youth and their families. Mike has overseen the development and implementation of Youth Reconnect, school-based homelessness prevention, and eternal roots, kinship finding and connection programs, as well as launching Niagara's Housing First for Youth response. And I just want to say, uh, when I had a good chance to, one of the benefits as the host is I get a chance to spend more time with everybody individually uh, and uh, had a great conversation with Mike. And uh, he talked about, uh, you know, some of the lessons they learned in Niagara actually came from Argus here, Argus, which is in uh, Cambridge and Waterloo Region. And, and, and Mike, I did have a good conversation with uh, the people from Argus just recently. So thank you for that. So we're going to talk about shelter diversion and the great work you're doing in Niagara. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, Rob. Thanks for having me. Uh, Pleasure to be here tonight. I know we have short time, so normally I like to provide lots of context for my statement, so I apologize if I'm just going to provide more statement than context, but uh, I'm around if people ever want to uh, get that context. Uh, so just a, just a little bit about myself, just sort of who I am uh, uh, and why I'm sort of presenting on the panel today. Uh, the work I've been running uh, the RAFT as executive director now for about 18 years. We started off as a, a youth shelter in the Niagara region in the city of St. Catharines. Uh, eight bed shelter. It was always full. We were constantly turning kids away. Um, it was a really inappropriate space. And we were lucky in that uh, the federal government at the time was funding uh, the building of shelters or the purchasing of shelters capital. And so we applied and we were successful. And I went from an eight bed shelter to a 24 bed shelter in 2007. Uh, and I thought that would be the uh, end of my problems because that seemed to be the, the common uh, answer to homelessness was, well, if your shelter is full, you need a bigger shelter. And so uh, that's what we did. However, very quickly after that, we were just full again at 20, 24 beds, um, seeing no different results from when we had eight beds. And that's what really forced me to sort of have to look at uh, what we were doing, why we were doing it. And, who are we doing it for? And, and really, is this the, the shelter really the best uh, option we have for, for people? Uh, we work primarily with youth, uh, 16 to 24, although I do a lot of work within the adults. So I think a lot of what I'm going to say is also, um, you know, very applicable to adults as well as young people. However, uh, the work that I primarily do is, is with youth. And so uh, in those years, those 2007, 2008 years, uh, we had about 500 individual kids uh, staying in our shelter uh, in those years. So that's a thousand kids over two years. Uh, then we started, and so I said, we went through that moment. Uh, we started looking at who was coming in our shelters, and we found out a lot of the kids were coming from outside of St. Catharines, were coming from the, the regions around, so the smaller towns and, and rural community. Uh, they were coming into the city. And then oftentimes they were forced to drop out of high school in order to, to be able to find shelter. And so that was, that's kind of how the system was set up because the shelters were all set up in urban centers because, and I still, still think maybe it's part of the ethos that, uh, you know, uh, homelessness is an urban problem, although I think that's really breaking down now. Um, so we were seeing all these kids coming in and we were forcing them to drop out of school. So we started working with schools to help identify students before they became homeless. Uh, we started running that, that's Youth Reconnect. We've started running that program 2007, 2008. Very quickly, we saw results. Uh, once we expanded that program across the entire Niagara region, uh, we went from having 500 kids in shelter to about 140 kids in shelter. And we've been able to maintain that uh, now for over a decade. But there's still 140 kids in shelter. That's not good enough. So um, that's where Argus came in uh, and shelter diversion program, which is a very simple concept. Uh, and, you know, and again, I've always said it's, it's, it's embarrassing how obvious some of these concepts are that seem to be such epiphanies uh, to us in the system. And so, uh, you know, that's that's your your humbling moment always in this work. And so shelter diversion, uh, which was a model that uh, we were able to adopt from Argus in Cambridge. They were I think there was their first year there running it, seeing excellent results. Uh, we basically uh, brought it here. Uh, exactly as Argus had designed it. We've made some tweaks since then, but uh, the, the foundational is still largely the Argus model. And it's, it's very simple. It's about asking questions 
before people come into shelter and asking largely, do you have anywhere else to go that's safe and appropriate? Uh, with the understanding that shelter isn't, you know, is always the last case scenario for people. That should always be the, the last choice. Uh, it's supposed to be for emergencies. Um, and so if people have other places to go, um, let's see if we can help them to it. And so that program, uh, we've seen a further reduction uh, by about 20% uh, overall uh, in those numbers. And so we're sitting at around 120 to 100, 120 youth access and shelter. Uh, the interesting thing about shelter diversion, if a young person has never been um, in a shelter before, our diversion rate sitting anywhere from 65 to 100% uh, of people who have never been in shelter before, that number falls off once we ha we start speaking with people who've had histories of shelter use, uh, but we're still doing fairly well, I think at uh, anywhere from sort of 25 to 45% of that group. But you can really see how uh, just exposure to shelter in and of itself uh, creates more homelessness. It, it creates and embeds homelessness in, in for people. And so largely when I think about homelessness now, uh, I think about two, I think you can divide uh, homelessness into largely two camps. Uh, you have what I consider the unhoused, and then we have what I consider people who are homeless. And the unhoused are people who uh, still have social relationships, uh, social relationships that they can leverage. Perhaps they can't leverage it right that night that they become homeless, but uh, they can, it, you know, within a few days they can leverage it. Uh, this group really responds well to transactional, which is largely what uh, North American answers to all problems tend to be is transactional. We tend to shy away from anything to do with relationships. It's a, cause that's in the, you know, that's in the private and, you know, private's always very complicated uh, in, a, in a liberal democracy. And so we tend to shy away from that. What we're very good at is transactional, you know, uh, and thinking of like Napoleon's insult of the British saying that they're all grocery store owners. Uh, you know, largely that's, that's how we, we approach things. We want to, uh, we want to, you know, we want to be able to transact away the problem. And for people who I consider the, the unhoused, that's actually what I'll, you know, it's, it's just a resource allocation issue. Uh, people just need that little support, might be a rent subsidy. Uh, it could just be, you know, being able to have bus tickets. It, it's, it is transactional by and large. However, the, the group that, uh, that I'm focused on and the group that ends up being the largest repeater uh, of people who access my shelter are who I consider the homeless. Uh, and really that is, I think, very uh, apt in that uh, this is a group of people who actually don't have home. And I also make the distinction in that um, a home doesn't require a house, a home requires people. And so I think that ultimately is the, is the fundamental issue uh, and why we're seeing such an increase in homelessness across all our communities uh, is that we're not dealing with the social aspect of homelessness, the social inclusion aspect of homelessness, and lacking that, we'll never actually be able to uh, make real headways into homelessness. And so, you know, if I was, could say, if leave you with anything, I think that would be the thing I'd leave you with. Uh, now, how to go about it, I think that's very difficult. I don't think, I don't have that answer. Uh, we're trying things. Um, we're really, sort of reimagining our programs around this. Uh, but uh, that's that's where I think if we're gonna spend some effort, we need to build up people's relationships. And when I say relationships, I also make again a distinction. Um, there is a role for, for professional services uh, in this space. However, there's a much bigger role for what I consider natural supports. And again, we tend to shy away from, again, natural supports. We tend to like professional supports so paid supports. Uh, but I think you, if all your friends are paid for, you have no friends. That's kind of how I look at it, right? Uh, we look at affordable housing just to kind of do a little bit of a tangent here, and then I'll, I'll finish up here. Um, when we look at affordable housing, I always find it very interesting. Uh, I, I've been doing this job for 20 years-ish. You know, I've been alive for 50. I don't remember a time when anything was affordable that you couldn't afford. Uh, there was never this time where they're giving away these houses. And so I find it very odd when people talk about affordable housing, because really what we're talking about are people who can afford something, they just can't afford enough. And most of the people I'm working with can't afford anything. And so there is no real level of affordable housing within that framework. 
which is why I think a lot of what happens in affordable housing never actually drifts down to the to the the, the folks I need to help to help with. However, especially in the case of youth, although you'd be uh, surprised how many uh, adults this is also true for. Uh, the single largest provider of affordable housing in Canada, if not North America, are families. Single largest provider of affordable mm -hmm. housing. Uh, makes up at least 70% of all housing in Canada. Right. Uh, and when we talk about affordable housing, it's always in the minimal 30%. We're spending all this effort trying to develop 30% of the market, and we do no work on developing the 70% of the market. The kids who are successful in my program is successful because we're able to attach them to natural supports. They can move back home. They can move in with uh, family, like kin, larger extended family. They move in with friends. It's people that end homelessness. Uh, and ultimately, until we start focusing on that 70%, we can spend all the money we want on the 30%, and we're only going to see this problem get worse. So, Mike, I just want to just want to jump in. So uh, it, one common theme between you and Margaret is you call it social inclusion. She refers to it as relational yeah. poverty. And uh, I think that's a very good point because that was sort of a bit of a light bulb moment for me when uh, I heard Margaret talk about it. And then when I had a conversation with you, you were talking about the same sort of thing. I just want to get, though, to... Um, the approach here is not waiting till they knock on your door at the shelter, right? It's developing those relationships with the institutions that can help identify uh, people that you can reach out to to see if you can work with them to get them into that 70% you're talking about, right? The the family, get them in, the, you know, whatever the relationship is with a family or, or whatever the issue is that they're dealing with to try and help them overcome that. Is that what we're talking about? Absolutely correct. So when we looked again, uh, we couldn't expand a raft in every community in Niagara. Uh, it would be too too costly. However, every community in Niagara has a school. And so by working with the schools, and that's where all the kids were. We found that the majority of kids were in school immediately prior to becoming homeless. And after family, with parents, teachers are the next large group. You know, uh, it's more than just a profession. It really is a calling for and, and so they have a, a real desire for the wellness uh, of their students. And they don't, they don't want to see their, these kids hurt. Uh, and they don't want to see them homeless. And so by working with this group that's really motivated uh, to, to care for the, their students, uh, it was a win-win. And that, that, like I said, that, that actually is the largest. That was 80% reduction. Uh, right. And we were able to affect the entire region. And so instead of all these kids being um, transplanted out of the smaller communities who then forced into larger cities and eventually end up in Toronto when they when they couldn't get the support here, um, by able to keep them in their home communities and support them there, uh, that's where their peers were, that's where their housed friends were, um, you know, and that's where where the caring adults were, and that's where their culture was. Yeah, and, and, and there have been a few comments in the chat line about, you, you touched a bit of a, 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 a thought with people about the rural issue and what to do with the rural issues. So the approach you're taking is, is working on that rural issue as well. For well, you're, And your youth are your, predominantly your uh, focus group, but it would be the same, would it, how, would it be, I'm just thinking now, would it be the same with respect to adults then? Like what? Uh, yeah, obviously uh, we have the benefit of the school system. Yeah. Um, you know, so, but uh, we have, I have done work with uh, some of the adult uh, shelter groups, uh, both here in Niagara and elsewhere. Uh, and the same kind of principles apply. And, and you'd be surprised. I mean, we, we think about uh, people being independent, adults being independent. However, I think if we realize in all our lives, um, no one is successful alone. Right. right. So there's no true independence. Uh, we like to think we're independent, but largely we are really dependent on, on people. Uh, yeah. And it's true. Of, and, I, and, that's, and that's where I think we're really doing a disservice, a disservice to people when we use this language of independence as if somehow uh, this is actually a, a, a goal we want to achieve. Like it, it's just isolating. Um, right. and it's not something we'd actually do on our own. So I don't know why we try and force it on others. Yeah, yeah obviously uh, we have the benefit of the school system. Yeah. Um, you know, so, but uh, we have, I have done work with uh, some of the adult uh, shelter groups, uh, both here in Niagara and elsewhere. Uh, and the same kind of, principles apply and and you'd be surprised i mean we we think about uh people being independent adults being independent however i think if we realize in all our lives um no one is successful alone 
right? right? So there's no true independence. Uh, we like to think we're independent, but largely we are really dependent on, on people. Uh, yeah. And it's true. Of, and, I, and, that's, and that's where I think we're really doing a disservice, a disservice to people when... Well, you know, we're always talking about supportive housing, so wraparound support. So there is that, uh, there's that truth. Um, so we'll wrap it up there. Thanks a lot, Mike.